welcome to the A to Z of licensed games, a series of vids about games that take something from something else. As we approach the home straight, it's getting tougher to cover new ground, but one thing I have not really done yet is look at the state of licensed games, well, now. Do they still have a place? Has anything changed at all? I mean, you do still see tie-in games come out for big action movies from time to time, but it seems as though they just come and go with very little fanfare. I look at most licensed games released today and I just see stuff that for the most part is boring, games I could barely form a sentence about. But then there are still licensed games that do more, usually ones that don't have a movie to promote and instead explore an already established license. Uh, Rocksteady's Batman games are a good example of that, and these games are at least more of an event than they used to be. There is one company today, however, that does seem to do little except licensed games, and they actually do a half decent job of it to boot. And that company would be one by the name of Telltale. Telltale Games started out in 2004, the brainchild of various people who used to work for LucasArts. It's little surprise then that their style is pretty similar, mostly adventure games, an evolution of the point and click genre with the same focus on story and script. After some middling CSI games to start, they hit their stride with the 2006 revival of Sam and Max, which introduced their unique approach to selling games, creating little two-hour episodic games, moulding a few of them into a season, and focusing on digital distribution. Sam and Max was a big hit, and others followed, including episodic stabs at Back to the Future and Jurassic Park. However, they didn't quite hit the heights of Sam and Max again. At least not until 2012, when they released The Walking Dead, a cut above everything they'd released so far. An adaptation focused more on the comic book than the TV show, Walking Dead was praised to the high heavens. Not only was it considered the best thing Telltale had released to date, it received a slew of Game of the Year awards as well. So licensed gaming was on top again, <laughs> at least for a little while. So rather than looking back at something old and long forgotten, this episode of our epic series can focus on something modern and loved. Of course, it's quite difficult to cover a game like this without going into too much detail about the plot, but I'll try my best. You play the role of Lee Everett, and you're on your way to prison, convicted of a regrettable crime of passion. You're having a nice chat with the amiable driver of your checkered limo, when all of a sudden someone walks into the road. And then everything basically goes to shit from there. The rest of time will be spent trying to survive the zombie apocalypse, you as well as anyone else you meet along the way. Although you'll probably be most concerned with the first person you meet, Clementine, an eight-year-old girl whose parents are missing. The majority of characters in Walking Dead are exceptionally well written and very well acted, but it's the relationship between Lee and Clementine that drives things forward. If every character has a wall, Lee's is that Clementine must be protected at any cost. But it's not just a completely one-sided fin between the father figure and whom he protects. Clementine is perhaps the best written and most believable natural character we've seen in gaming for years. The relationship between Lee and Clementine actually reminds me a lot of the one between father and son in The Woad by Cormac McCarthy. Because in the end, both of them really do need each other in order to survive. Because otherwise, well, what's the point in the apocalypse? One of the main things Walking Dead did in terms of adventure games was to take the focus away from puzzle solving. Instead, the focus is more on developing relationships with the other characters through your actions. There is a big choice element, particularly when it comes to people you have to save. It's not always clear-cut, and no matter what, there is a main overdriving plot that will be followed no matter what choices you make, but the game does hit a balance between giving you the freedom to choose what you think is right, and not going too overboard with it and creating anarchy. And at all times, the choices that you make will fit in with Lee as a character. You don't shape him completely, you just add to him. And it's this sense of being fully in control, in spite of still somewhat being controlled, that really does make The Walking Dead. It's not the first adventure game to deal with choice and relationships as opposed to puzzles, but no other adventure game has reached its level. Of course, it's not entirely perfect. As far as storytelling goes, there are some little points where the game does fluff its lines. I'll try not to spoil too much here, but there's one point in the first episode where Lee has to deal with a character that's very close to him, but is infected. And we see him hesitate, we see him struggle with what he has to do, and then he bucks himself up for it. And all we can really hope for for the character is a quick, dignified end. 
Instead, you control Lee as he tries vainly to axe the person several times before finally, at long last, putting them out of their misery. It's a bit much, and it becomes a bit too heavy-handed and drawn out. Suddenly the game feels like it's trying too hard for a sad moment, instead of just letting it happen. Sometimes, you know, it's better to just take the control away, or perhaps to even not show the moment at all. However, this is only a small minor nitpick. For the most part, Walking Dead does get it right. As a story, it's one of the best we have ever seen in gaming. As far as licensed games go, it's of a far higher calibre than the majority of games I've been covering, hence why this feature's been quite long. And if for whatever reason you've not played it yet, it's well worth doing so. It's a game that should drive storytelling sure? forward in this medium, and it's one of the first stories in gaming that could honestly, with a straight face, be described as an actual, mature work. I'm here with you. You're a good man. I think the honourable mentions might need to lighten things up a little. Although the quantity of licensed games in W isn't high, the quality most definitely is. Two games here could easily have been the feature title. The Warriors is one of Rockstar's lesser known titles, based off a cult 70s film where a gang has to survive the night in New York City with every other gang out there at their throats. It's the sort of thing that can easily be made into a fine beat em up, and Rockstar duly obliged. The Warriors was definitely one of the better titles to be made in the PS2's late period. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? CAN YOU DIG IT? Yeah, had to do it, sorry. Uh, the other title that could have definitely been featured? World of Illusion, the Mega Drive sequel to the excellent Castle of Illusion that we saw long ago. If anything, this game is better. Donald Duck comes along for the ride, the platforming is just as strong as it is in the original game, and above all else, the game is flat out gorgeous. Still one of the best looking 2D platformers around, plus it added some co-op. It's a very relaxing little game, and I love playing it now just as much as I did 20 years ago. Next up, Waterworld. Now you might be thinking, hang on, isn't Waterworld a really shit film, and a shit game into the bargain? And you'd be right on both counts, this is not good at all. However, the SNES version has one saving grace. Composer Dean Evans just happened to create one of the 16-bit era's most atmospheric and moody soundtracks. Let's just relax a little here and listen to the diving theme. Seriously, this is one of the best soundtracks of the whole era. Shame that it's obscured by being on such a crappy game. And lastly, I'm heading to the arcades for Capcom's Willow. Games did come out on consoles based on the erstwhile 80s fantasy flick, but weirdly not this one. Shame because it's quite decent as far as arcade side-scrollers go. It's really tricky, but you know, it's got that Capcom quality, and again, considering that Capcom made it, you know, shame it wasn't out on consoles. Could have been a very good NES title, I reckon. Hey ho. Music takes centre stage for the shit room, more specifically, rap music. Despite everything that Kurt Hennig ever said to me about rap being crap, I've always loved it, especially the Wu-Tang Clan. They ruled a pretty solid part of my late 90s landscape. 36 Chambers, Wu-Tang Forever, not to mention all those brilliant solo albums, they were and are great records. And they felt so goddamn dangerous. Wu-Tang wasn't just a group, it was an entire crew of hungry, determined motherfuckers ready to swarm to the top. To listen to them on something like Shame on a Nigga, Triumph or Wu-Tang Clan Ain't Nothing to Fuck With is to feel like you're ready to take 12 rounds with Tyson. Seems like interesting material to work with, from a video game perspective. In the end, wrestling prodigy Zaki were the ones that did it. The Def Jam series were games where rappers, including several Wu members, beat the shit out of each other. And it was terrific. Honestly, rap stars have come out of gaming far better than most musicians have. If we'd have done numbers, a uh, 50 cent blood on the sand might well have had a full feature. But before all of that, there was one entirely based around the Wu-Tang Clan. Wu-Tang Shaolin style for the PS1, which unfortunately missed the mark somewhat. The concept is at least okay. The Wu-Tang Clan have to save their master from an evil Chinese clan? Okay. 
It's your basic kung fu sort of deal, and old kung fu movies are a pretty big theme in all of Wu Tan's output. You know, it's kind of amusing, it'd almost be like a kids' show version of Wu Tan Clan, if it wasn't for all that late 90s blood, guts, and decapitation. You can control any member of the clan you want, including the almighty old early bastard, who naturally adopts a drunken master style of fighting. It all seems to shape up okay, but well, then you actually get to the fighting. Shaolin style is a full 3D fighter, where you're often placed against multiple opponents and the control scheme is sort of like Tekken, the buttons taken on the wall of each of your limbs. But it's all just so stiff and annoying. Something simple, just like jumping is a chore, and there's nothing much to shout about in the way of combos or even grabs. And the game doesn't really do enough with the surroundings, all you get is basically a simple textured box to fight in with nothing to actually use. You know, what about some weapons or some quakes? Eh, of course they might come later in the game for all I know, but it all just feels like nothing. And then you just get times when the fights feel unfair, through overly simplistic AI. Guys who completely stop when you're blocking, and then immediately start attacking when you move. You know, simple tactics, sure, sure, but it makes the fighting feel robotic and fake, taking you out of the game completely and almost making the fight feel like a puzzle. It all adds up to a game that's kinda disappointing. Mass brawler sort of games aren't a bad idea, and on the PS2 Aki really brought them to life. Hell, you could also look at the Warriors in the Honourable Mentions for a game that takes the old fighting formula to a new level. But Shaolin style wasn't there yet. It ain't Pit Fighter or Guardians of the Hood, thank god, but considering the license, you know, it's disappointing. A Wu-Tang game should have been so much more than this. But hey, you know, it's licensed games. Cash rules everything around them. Cream, get the money. Dollar dollar bill, y'all. So W's out the way then. And no, you don't get any prizes for guessing what's coming up in the letter X. I think we'll be starting with some X-Men. Then after that, we'll be moving on to X-Men, maybe a bit more X-Men, and we'll probably be finishing it with X-Men. It's not like there's much else to see in the bloody letter. So the band of superheroes will take centre stage, but until then, thanks for watching and wherever you are, whoever you be, have a good one, take care, and I'll see you next time.